بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم ألهمنا مراشد أمورنا وأعذنا من شرور أنفسنا Then during those days which are known as the best days, the good days, in during those places which are known as unique places, good places, Allah involves His servants in very good actions. For which reason it is necessary, we know the month of Ramadan comes and everyone feels that, hey, if I'm doing wrong, I can't do it. Yeah. Just that feeling that I can't do it now, there are those boys, there are those girls, even if they're doing haram. There were so many examples. One we used to hear many a time. The person running a bar. But he passes away on a Jumu'ah. The reason is that when the month of Ramadan would come, he would just say to his customers. The customers would say to him, but we're not Muslim. What difference it makes about Ramadan? We're not Muslim. He would say, I am Muslim. When Allah Taala loves a servant, He gives a certain amount of feeling for something great. In the month of Ramadan, the person says, I just can't do it. Now we are entering what is known as the ten days of Zul Hijjah. And ulama have written this, that how much we know of Ramadan, unfortunately we don't know of these ten days. Perhaps if you were going for Hajj, you will say, something's happening. But when the people are not there for Hajj, it was as though this great days are only reserved for Makkah, Mukarramah, whereas it was not meant to be like that. This was such a unique time, Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are no days on which righteous deeds are more beloved to Almighty Allah than the ten days of Zul Hijjah. These will be the ten days starting now. <coughs> Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked, not even jihad in the path of Allah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, not even jihad. Unless a man goes out for jihad taking his wealth with him and he does not return with anything. Meaning he took everything and if he came back, he came back with nothing. Then perhaps that man will be said that you did something greater than the man who made ibadah in the state. This is what we're going to enter. Ulama then mentioned that when Allah Tabarukta wants to take his servant to task, and may Allah save us all, we must not be taken to task. Then there are those certain great periods where Allah Tabarukta puts his servant, or he opens the door for him for even. And in the most unique of days, this individual walks towards his path of hell. There was an individual who in the land of Makkah, Mukarramah had a dream. He saw Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam in his dream. So he got very happy. Yusuf alayhi salam in my dream, a Nabi of Allah. He phoned Hazrat Mawlana Yunus Patel Sab, Rahimahumullah. Allah puts interpretations in the hearts of his selected servants. So he said, Hazrat, I had a dream. I saw Yusuf alayhi salam. He said, where are you? He said, yeah, I am Makkah, Medina. Hazrat Mawlana Yunus Patel Sab, Rahimullah, asked him, is it perhaps that you are at the moment involved in an illicit affair? And perhaps you are getting involved in that affair right there in the haram. Meaning when everyone else is going to the haram, she is meeting you in the hotel. He said, right there are you perhaps doing something. And he was just silent. Like. How he understood it is as though Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam had to come in his dream and say, oh my friends, I was in the house of Zulekha. She was like a mother to me. She grew me up. I saw her every day. 
If she called me in the kitchen, I had to be in the kitchen because I was a slave. If she told me clean the bathroom, if there was a bathroom in that time, I had to clean it. If she told me make the bedding, I had to make the bedding. I had to be in and out, in and out. And when that woman then said to me that, no one is around, it's only me. At that time, Nabi Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam had to say that I want to go out. And he pushed himself away. She pulled, he pushed. And again when that woman later on, and many other women came and said to him that you are just a slave in the house. If you got anything of worth, it's because of her, she's your mother. She grew you up. And then she said to Yusuf alayhi salam, and if you don't give in to me, then I will put you in the jail. And Yusuf alayhi salam said, As-sijnu ahabbu ilayya. That I'd rather go to prison. It wasn't a small issue that to go to prison. In that era, who was going to prison perhaps would not be coming out for prison for years. There was no Zuma section that time that you put me in jail one time, the whole country I'll take away. Yusuf alayhi salam, when they sent him to prison, there was no date like you'll come out after eight years. There was no court case. The minister of Egypt felt you should go to jail, you'll never come out again. Finished. And Yusuf alayhi salam said, I'll go to prison. Coming in the dream of that individual as though saying, I was in such a place and I ran out. You landed right by the Kaaba and you opening the door. When Allah Tabarukullah wants to take a certain servant to task, Allah save us all. In the very great days, doors open. <coughs> it could be in Ramadan. It could be on the day of Eid. It could be when some people are on Arafat crying, somebody else is. So we have reached an era in life where evil has opened up very fast and very big. It was a few months ago when an event took place in America. It was a concert. And then in the concert certain people were like pricked. And it was famous. But the news how they quickly can close something. Few people fell pricks. Or few, quite a few people. And then they just fell down to the ground. And some had their phones with them. Because America everyone got a smartphone. Some had their phones. They actually took like clips. Of people carrying dead bodies. And as they were carrying it out, other people are still dancing. And the man who was like the boss, the DJ, he's looking at it. And they even recorded that he smiled when he saw that thing happening in front of him. It happened, it was not long ago. We spoke about it a little. But it was far away from this country. What hurt us the most at that time was one of those boys who died in that place was a Muslim. The investigation, I don't know if that investigation ever happened after that. It's just like closed. What was that purpose of that killing? It was called satanic killings. Satanic killing means that certain people now have reached a level they have to make an offering to the devil. So they know there's a chance they can get caught. They know there's a chance for the next two years I'll not be invited again to any club. But because now I am making my what we will call Qurbani. He has to make his Qurbani to the devil. Ibrahim alayhi salam in his dream was shown you will slaughter your son for me. And Ibrahim alayhi salam said Allah I'll do it for you. And he then put that knife. But almighty Allah is Allah. Immediately Jibreel alayhi salam came. Before Jibreel alayhi salam even reached, the knife could not cut. They wrote that the most tender skin is the skin of a Nabi. And the knife was sharp and the strongest arm is the arm of a Nabi. The arm of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the skin of Ismail alayhi salam, a sharp knife. But Allah in His kindness said, you will not cut. And how he tried and it could not cut. And then he heard Jibreel alayhi salam saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Meaning the work is done. 
Allah in His kindness asks for sacrifice. But Allah does not disappoint. As for the devil, he also does the same. Those that give their lives for him, they must also make sacrifices. And there's one thing if they're sacrificing their own child. And perhaps they do that also. Perhaps they do that. What happens in there behind the scenes, who knows? But then they come to the level where the devil says, I want big sacrifices. And what's happening in recent times, what happened there, and I'm no investigator, but what happened now in South Africa, where in that one place or one club, 21 or 20 children were just, just died. Just died. And now a major investigation must take place. They'll spend billions on it and they'll come nowhere. In the ending they'll say, very hard to find out what happened. If they just have to listen to the bayan, they'll understand what it was. Those people are sacrificing to the devil. So those boys, that girls must die in front, it's why I offer you. Even that tavern owner knows perhaps his tavern will get closed after that. But he's ready to take the chance because he has to make an offering. How the world is going. The time has passed already where a person says, I'm a little naughty. That little naughty don't work anymore. It is either you dying for Allah or you are dying for the devil. That's how the two paths are going. (laughs) It was a few years ago where we heard about a woman traveled from one country all the way to Switzerland. She came in front of a certain statue. She put her head down. All the way from one country she traveled. She put her head down in front of the statue. And then late at night she was surrounded by what we will call people with dro- like drapes. Whoever they were late at night. And then one of them just came and slit her throat. It would never have been mentioned also, but it seems that at that area there was a certain camera. So that camera caught it. And then there was a big issue, number one, who is this woman? And it leaked out that this woman actually came on a certain flight. And I read about it after that, that man who even mentioned where she came from. Within a few weeks after that, he got fired. They were not going to open any case. They were not going to open any case where she came from. One man, he thought that it's important to know. He leaked it. They fired him. She came from wherever she came to sacrifice her soul to who she thought I can trust, the devil. We heard it, but she was a disbeliever who came. It never really hurt us. Because had she died on Kufar, she was also in the fire. And then she just died for the devil. But we have now reached a time where it's so hard to say that there are now Muslims who are walking on this road. That they are also making certain steps. That if the devil says to me, are you ready to make the sacrifice? We have reached a point in this ummah where a Muslim is ready to make that sacrifice for the devil. Allah Taala says, "Afatatakhidunahu wa zuriyatahu awliyaa amin duni." That have you made him and his progeny your friend? Wa hum lakum adu, whereas he is your worst enemy. Bi'sa li zalimin badala. Allah says, you are the worst of oppressors, the one who has done that. And he said, what a substitute you have taken. You left Allah out. Whereas you're supposed to die to become the friend of Allah. But you said, I don't want your friendship. I want to rather go for the devil. Whoever became Allah's, the knife could not cut. Whoever became Allah's, the knife could not cut. When Allah said, Allahu Akbar, the work is done. The exam was taken severe, but Allah never disappoints. 
At a time where you think the door never opens, Allah opens it. And whoever made the devil his friend, the devil pulls him on a road where it comes, there's no turning back. If you say, I want out, there's disgrace. And if you go forward, also there's disgrace. Look at all these huge, what we will call most popular, powerful residents of so many countries. There's a time when they reach a point where they also try to say, I can't do further. My nature won't allow it. That's when you see the collapse of that powerful man. Suddenly everywhere in the news his name is. Now all the scandals are coming out. Now he can't hide his face anywhere. They pull you to a certain point. Now if you want to come back, Saddam Hussein, (coughs) he grew up in a world of what we have called atheistic thought. He was part of what is known as a Ba'ath party. Ba'ath is the English, Arabic word is Ba'ath. The Ba'ath means renaissance, the Arabian renaissance. Arabian renaissance means we will change the Islamic world to make it a satanic world. This was Saddam Hussein. And many of these others. He hated Islam, he hated the people of Islam. If he worshipped anyone, he worshipped the American powers and the devils behind them. He was put in power by the Ba'ath, Ba'ath, Muslim, Arabian Renaissance, meaning no more Islam, we have come to take over Islam. And then for many years he did what he had to do. Whatever came from that side, what we will call the Western powers, immediately Saddam did it. He killed whoever had to be killed. He tortured whoever had to be tortured. And then came when we were small, we called it the Gulf War. Where he contacted his boss. But now the time of Saddam was finished now. They used him how much they wanted to. So later on his own people, advisors, they wrote that Saddam Hussein did not go into Kuwait until permission came from those bosses. They told him, go into Kuwait. He went with his soldiers into Kuwait. And the next thing he knew, those very bosses, those very bosses made a deal with Saudi Arabia. That if you allow us, we will attack him and make sure that he learns such a lesson which will never be forgotten. Saudi Arabia immediately said, all conditions accepted, come in. But Saddam Hussein was the most shocked of all. He only went in with the permission of the boss. And when the boss heard he's in, bang, there's a certain bridge. You would have been perhaps very young or not born at that time when the Gulf War took place. We were in school at that time. For us, we thought it's a Muslim war because Muslim against America. It was a created war. He never knew why he went in. Then there was one girl who cried. She cried. They brought her on public television. She cried. She said, they are pulling. They are taking out young children from the incubators. These Iraqi soldiers are pulling them out from the incubators. And she cried. She said, please, Americans, help those Iraq, those Kuwaiti children, where America ever bothered about one Muslim. But on that day, everyone in America started crying, nightmares they were having. Poor Kuwaiti girl, boy, in the incubator. Ten years later, they'll find out this girl, she lived in America. This girl who came on television, she was never in Kuwait. She and her whole family lived in America. So everyone knew it, they say now too late. Too late. And America launches attack. There's a certain bridge which is called the bridge of hell. This bridge of hell was that all the Iraqi soldiers when they saw that they being defeated, they asked permission to retreat. Permission was given. They turned. And they had to all pass a certain bridge. 
And as they were coming to that bridge, that's when that very same boss was waiting. American bombers were waiting for them at the bridge where they promised retreats. As they reached that bridge, everything fell. Whatever could fall, fell. It was known as the bridge of hell. Because no one passed that bridge. No one. As for Saddam Hussein, he went home and he was like shocked. Who I gave my life to. And how they just... This is the devil and the people who work with the devil. Later on then, he had ulama brought in front of him, the very man who killed so many ulama. His own friends wrote, it was the first time a Quran came in his hands. After this. First time. He began reading Quran, because he learned who his enemy is. Who he trusted. He began reading Quran. It affected him so much that what we had read at that time was he had a fund created for all the widows of those who were killed in that war. As though he took it, it was my mistake. I was the reason all of their families were killed. He had a fund created for the widows and he paid into that fund till the end of his life. He had ulama brought closer to him. Then a lot of things started happening. A lot of things. And then what is called, many of you will know that then came the time where America now needed to get rid of him. And then they had that thing, that weapons of mass destruction which they never ever found. But they just needed him. So it's a very long story and then they entered Iraq. And unfortunately what has happened in Iraq today is very very sad. But it was mentioned in narrations that before the end of time the land of Iraq Iraq had, in the past meant Iraq and Iran. It will revert back to what it was in the beginning. When Islam came, this was the center of evil. When Islam came, this was the center of evil. And the land of Sham was known as the center of goodness. And Allah's Nabi also made indication close to the end of times, both will return to their origins. Sham will become again the center of goodness. And unfortunately for Iraq, so Iran had already become Shia Iran. And now with America getting rid of Saddam Hussein, it has become Shia Iraq. The amount of people of the Sunnah that they are killing, that land is no longer what we will call a Muslim land. As for the land of Sham, Syria, Bashar al-Assad tried so hard to wipe out every one of the sunnah. But Allah in His system, this land will stand. If you go visit today, you will see already in Syria what a place has been created where people are very, very firm on their deen. And slowly, slowly they're going further in. Allah's system, the world is going on its route. However, Saddam Hussein, after he was caught, they were going to then execute him. That was a couple of years ago. Many people would remember his execution. And then they executed him, whether it was done on television or whatever, we will not know. Those who saw it, saw it. But then at that time I read one article. One scholar of Islam had written of the death, the execution of Saddam Hussein. He says, this was a man, perhaps the only man who before be, being executed was able to smile. Smile. They thought that when they kill him, his face will show panic and fear. And it will be a message to all the other puppets that you see Saddam never played the game. That's what will happen to you if you don't play the game. But he smiled and then they killed him. They never thought he would smile. So this alim wrote, the smile of Saddam was not what they wanted. But his smile did send a message to all the puppets around. That I also sold my soul to the ones that you have sold your soul to. 
But it is the kindness of my Allah before I died, He let me realize where I was walking. Because of which I can die with a smile. He said, if you are not going to realize, the alim is writing, the smile of Saddam Hussein gave a message to the puppets of the world. If you are not going to realize who you have sold your soul to today, you will not die smiling. You will not die smiling. When this thing happened in South Africa now, so in the news they had certain sentences of those people who were in that club, tavern, whatever they call it. One person's sentence was very nice. But they said, I saw the person dying in front of me. And saying, help me, help me. And then the other person says, I lied to my parents. I told them I'm going to a friend for a party, but I was going here. He said, I'm so ashamed I lied to my parents. It's only when I was in that place, I thought, why did I lie? I read that and I thought, it must not happen with me and you. That a day came, comes where we say, I am so ashamed, I lied to my Allah. He told me, don't go. And I still went. When they were dying, no one was smiling. When they were dying, no one was smiling. He died and he smiled. His smile was to say to the world, see who you are selling your soul to. They executed him, but he went with a smile. May Allah Tawarukala inspire us all through his smile also. If you die for Allah, you will go into the fire of the devil and you will land up in the garden of paradise. You die for the devil You'll get disgraced in this world. And from one disgrace, you'll go worse into another. Ughriqo. Ughriqo. Those that Allah drowned, the people of Nuh alayhi salam, the people of Firaun. Drowning itself is terrible. The waters fell on them from all sides. Whoever tried to swim, how could you swim? You were taken to the bottom of the ocean. Ughriqo. Ughriku, go right in the bottom. You'll say, what a terrible death. Quran says, you call that terrible. For udkhilu nara, immediately pushed into the fire. Started in water, screaming, screaming. You said, you think this is bad. What's coming after is even worse. Then pushed into the fire. Burn and burn and burn in the fire. Every time the man will say, if it's going to ever end, the angel will say, this is only the world between dunya and akhirah. This is barzakh. If I can explain to you, it's nothing but the menu. What punishment is still going to come? Jahannam is known as the place where Allah will show His punishment. That angel will try to explain, this is what we are punishing. Jahannam is the place of punishment. That is one road that these people are taking. Allah save us all. Me and you, we must die for Allah. And these days that are now coming, when Allah wants goodness for His servants, when great days come, Allah puts him in good actions. It might just happen this year, our madrasa, our holidays are different from normal school holidays. But we do get what is called a Bakri Eid holiday, Qurbani. And now we hear everyone saying, and the schools also got holiday that time. So everyone is like happy, at least we got holiday with you. One worry is, on the madrasa when they give us holiday, they tell you, remember, don't make it a holy day. Holy means full of holes. If you want to make it, you'll have to make it holy, H-O-L-Y, not H-O-L-E-Y. So then at least to a certain extent the students understand, you know, it's only 10 days. Go make kurbani, go slaughter the animal. Few days keep roza, fast, take a little rest. But when school holidays comes, 
I don't think any of your teachers will tell you that. The world system is when holidays come, what was this party in the club for? You will think they were celebrating, they graduated from Mitzik. They only finished two classes or three classes. Some of those children were only 13 or 12 years old. You say, you got lot years of school, only mid-year this is. The system of the world is when holidays come, party. Break every law. Do what you want. And the system by Almighty Allah is, if you are looking for your holiday, it's coming in the grave. Until that day, walk a road that is straight. We grow up in their system sometimes, so when our holidays come, we also get free. And we forget that these are very big days. Don't let that holiday atmosphere spoil these days. It is known that if a holiday came in Ramadan, then many a boy will say, I'm going to make a takeoff. Because in Ramadan, even that girl, she puts on scarf. Even that girl. But now it's not Ramadan. Allah, make it not happen. That during these 10 days, there's an individual where one person is saying, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik Allah, I am here for you. And another person is dancing for the devil. One person can perhaps die in his ihram during the next few days. And Allah's Nabi Islam said, He passed away in ihram. His hajj will continue every year. Meaning as though an angel will be sent for him every year to make that hajj. One of the greatest honors, you die with ihram. They bury you with that ihram. That's your coffin. They don't take out that ihram. You die in ihram, you get buried with that ihram. Every year your hajj is being made. It's an action that says never goes off. During those days, Allah not make it that a Muslim dies in a club. One went straight to paradise, he died in ihram. And the other one died in that funny tight suit. One goes straight into the garden, one goes straight into the fire. In these days that are coming, let's understand what it is. When Allah's Nabi said, not even jihad in the path of Allah is more beloved to Almighty Allah than His worship during these days. So it's big. And then will come the day of Eid. The greatest day in the sight of Almighty Allah is the day of Nahar, slaughtering. Which to a great extent many of us on that day become like pious. Let's get involved. Allah's Nabi said, and the day after it also. And the day after. So those two days, to a great extent, people are busy with the animal, with the slaughtering it has kept us. It's just that from the first of Zul Hijjah, from the first of Zul Hijjah, tomorrow night they look for the moon. From the first of Zul Hijjah till that ninth, which is known as the day of Arafah. Tenth, everyone will be here for Eid Salah. Everyone will be saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. From the first to that ninth, it's a holiday time. If you want to, in these days, you can go to the Arsh of Almighty Allah. And if you want, and Allah not let anyone wonder that, you can fall very far from the Arsh of Allah. It is very unique days. Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa would fast on these days. And a lot of virtue was mentioned for keeping the rosa on every of these days. If your nature is such, some boys say, I'm very hot. They are the best during these days when the government can't give us heaters. At least you say, you're lucky you're hot. Like, you don't need. So they say, I'm too hot. So if you want to make yourself a little cold during these days, keep rosa. Fast. Immediately by fasting you will understand these are not the days to go into holiday mood. To just wake up in the morning there was no fajr. There was no dhuhr. They were just planning where we going out because everyone has to have a holiday. 
Say, how can my school holiday go and I never go somewhere? Let's go somewhere. But when going somewhere, then if you go to the wrong place, ulama have written, just as the recitation of the Quran is the hallmark of Ramadan, what is the ibadah of these ten days now? Dhikr is the hallmark of the blessed days of Zul Hijjah. And this is what we will speak about. What will we do now? The moon will be sighted. It will be said the first of Zul Hijjah. Where Quran is the hallmark of Ramadan. Where everyone starts. Everyone. Extra Quran I'm reading. Dhikr is the hallmark of these days. Normally when you say the word Dhikr. Then a young boy. He always thinks of a tasbih. And as soon as he thinks of a tasbih, he thinks of his daddy and dada, grandfather, grandmother. That grandmother, she got nothing to do at home, she can't even cook. So because of that, I always see her with the tasbih. Because that thought comes, the boy says, a vicar is for my daddy. If you mention anything now, I'll take it also and say, daddy, you're reading Lord, read this also. As for the boy, the girl, he say, I'm young. So is dhikr for me and you? Are we also supposed to be making the dhikr and why? And what it's supposed to do to us? Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There are no days greater in the sight of Almighty Allah or in which good deeds are more beloved to Almighty Allah than these ten days. He then said during these days, Recite La ilaha illallah in abundance. He said read Allahu Akbar in abundance. He said say Alhamdulillah in abundance. Three dhikrs. We will only speak about one dhikr which is called Allahu Akbar. And how we have to use the dhikr to make us different from everyone else. A tabi'i says, I saw sahaba radiallahu anhum. During the 10 days of Zul Hijjah, they would be saying Allahu Akbar so much and so loudly. This you will see if you go for Hajj. When you will see one caravan coming or one group, especially those from Nigeria when they come, South Africans, we are those that we can't talk a lot. That's why if the government puts off the electricity, the most we can do is press buttons and complain. Send a message on the phone. But you get some people whose voices are loud when they scream, the government will hear it without the phone also. They are those who are burning tires at the moment. They got a loud voice. We haven't got. When you're making hajj, and then you just hear, Allahu Akbar, it's like one bus is coming. Everyone just moves. And that whole jamaat goes straight to the Kaaba. There Allahu Akbar is like what he is saying. He says when they would say Allahu Akbar, I could compare it to the crushing of waves. You will see it if you go for Hajj. You know, one Allahu Akbar, even that Saudi guard moves. And that whole jama just comes and they ride by the Kaaba suddenly. And everyone is pushed out of the way. Then you hear another one, Allahu Akbar, and they coming. When they come, that whole haram like echoes with the Allahu Akbar. We won't do that there. If you had to do that, everyone in the house will run out think there's a bomb. So we're not going to go high. But we need to come on to one zikr. We will try and get for these 10 days the zikr of Allahu Akbar. Why we need to come on to it? As for what it will do to us there by Almighty Allah. Although it is very easy to utter with the tongue, on the day of Qiyamah, you will find it very heavy on the scale. It will wipe away every sin. It will lead to unparalleled reward. It will cultivate the trees and the plants of paradise. It will be a protection from the fire of Jahannam. Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whatever Allahu Akbar you will make, Alhamdulillah you will make, Subhanallah you will make, La ilaha illallah you will make. He says it will gather around the arsh of Almighty Allah. It will buzz like a bee. 
And when it pulls the attention of Almighty Allah, it will mention your name directly to Allah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Do you not wish that you can have someone who mentions your name by Allah? Do you not wish that you can have someone? So he says, Do you not wish that by the arsh of Almighty Allah you can have? Yesterday a Jamaat came to visit me from Dammam. Arabs. So I asked like, Something ajeeb, ajeeb qissa, something unique. So he says, about 20 years ago, perhaps, I wasn't exactly sure, I never understood everything, but the crux of what he explained was, there was this person working in the police force in Saudi Arabia, and the system is that to get your promotion, you have to be ready to move. Like how you're becoming a doctor, they say you now you'll have to do service. And normally when they put you in service, they put you in very difficult areas. So he needed promotion, but to get promotion you have to be ready to move. He never want to move. So like how in South Africa, the first thing you think about is the contact. That I just need a contact, and all he has to do is just sign like something closer to home. I mean there's so many towns, why you want to send me far away? Something closer to home. And he had a lot of friends. But every time he's asking someone and time is getting closer for that message to come, where are you going to be sent? Every time he's asking someone he can trust that your contact will work. The guy said, I'll try, try. And afterwards, the guy's not answering the phone. And now another contact. And time is getting closer and you don't want to go. Because to separate from your family, you don't know how many years in another place, you need the promotion. But you don't want to go. So normally when things don't go real, then you land up in the masjid. As he was telling me that, he said, wait, another qissa ajeeba. Another ajeeb story, I'll tell you. So then he went on to one unique story. We'll go to that story. It got nothing to do with this, but at least you'll understand like how Allah does. He says, this jamaat came and they're knocking at someone's door. Or the bell, they press the bell. Just before they press the bell, husband and wife, were having a major argument. And finally the husband, he decided to divorce her. So she said, I'm taking my things and I'm going. Whatever she said, no one knows really what they said to each other. So she was in the car, and I think he was also in the car, and he was going to take her now, to drop her off by her father's house and give her one talaq. And someone rings the bell. Now obviously if he opens the garage, he knows the person ringing the bell is there. So you have to jump out of your car, and then you go through the door, and he sees the jamaat there. Arabs got a unique, whereas us in South Africa, you might swear the jamaat, like, what you coming now? But Arabs, they got this thing that they have to be hospitable. So he's looking at them now, and he said, come in, come in, because Arabs will always come in, come in. So the Jamaat came in now, and normally Arab hospitality is you have to make tea. So he told them, just wait here, I'm coming now, and now he runs to the garage. And says to his wife, can you give me a cup of tea? And she is just, Chup. she's just looking like, woman are woman. When they want to hit hard, they hit the hardest. She's just looking straight. And he's, Begging her, please, my guests, how am I going to tell them I'm on the verge of kicking out of the house? Please give me a cup of tea. And she's just looking. And sitting, sitting with them. Now he runs back. He runs back, he's sitting. That mutakallim is trying to talk. He's not even knowing what that man is talking. He is why is, is she in the kitchen. So that man spoke a little. He said, he said, just give me a little bit. And he runs back. No one's in the kitchen. He runs to the, please, I beg you, my izzat. Come to the kitchen, please. And she's just looking straight. Then he runs back again. That mutakallim is also wondering, what's carrying on here? Like, maybe no electricity. This house had lot of electricity, had no fire. There was no one in the house. And then he says, he ran up and down about three times. 
And then when he came to the garage, he saw she wasn't in the car. And then he runs to the kitchen and there she was making the tea. And he just like, he started crying. And then she started crying. Now they're crying. Cup of tea. And both are crying. And that Jamaat is waiting for the tea. <laughs> he said it was so amazing. That Jamaat don't know what's happening also. They're wondering where he is. He is making a new honeymoon. He just got married. <laughs> waiting for your tea. Finally he brought the tea. You are smiling so much with the tea. they wondering what the issue is. A cup of tea. For him it's my life got made again. He said to them that you cannot go until you'll have supper by my house. So the rehabar is saying that, you know, we've got a couple of houses and we have to still go for the Isha Salah and program. He said, you're not going. My wife said she will make a meal for you. They said, we need to go. They said, please, let me tell you, you saved my life. Like, so what happened? Now they couldn't go. They had their meal. They came back late. The Amir of the Jamaat asking like, how many houses you all did today? <laughs> one house. He said, one house. He said, we saved one house. He said, we saved one house. He said, how Allah's system is when the mercy of Allah is allowed to come. So then the, uh, the person who's explaining the story to me, he said, let me tell you the wisdom behind this. He said, the devils were in that house. And they were making the husband hate the wife, the wife hate the husband. He said when he opened his door to allow the jamaat to walk in, they came with the angels of Allah. When the angels entered, the devil had to run. When the devil ran, mind of the man and the woman got sense again. Then he saw her for who she was, she saw him for who he was. You allow the devil to enter your house, Meaning Ramadan ended, the Quran cupboard closed, and the devil cupboard opened. The computer opened in every room, the television was on in every room. Then later on they come and said, we got major problems in our marriage, please help me. The answer will be, you kicked out the angels, you brought the devil, and now you want to bring a manual how to make love in a house. You will not see her for your wife because the devil is that barrier. He'll make every other woman look smart. She will never see you as a good husband because the devil is the barrier. He'll make every other man look good. Let Allah's angels walk in, then the devil has to run out. But me and you sometimes, we are also scared to let Jibreel alayhi salam's army of good angels enter. We are also scared. One man was walking with his dog. So somebody told him that you must never be so close to your dog. These dogs, they lick you sometimes. He said, don't you know the angels of Allah don't come with his dogs. When a person becomes filthy in nature, his talk becomes filthy also. So with a filthy talk, he answered, he said, that's why I got the dog. I don't want the angels. Man was amazed, what you mean? You want to mock Allah, people are ready in today's time, they're mocking. He wanted to mock. He says, isn't you people say that the angel of death will come? I got my dog. Because of my dog, angel can't come to me. I won't die. The man laughed and he said, you idiot. The dog only keeps away the angels of mercy. As for the angels of the punishment of Allah, this dog brings them. You can't run away from Allah. But there are some people today who really think I can get out of the system. That I don't want angels in my house. And you ask, what do you want? Then you want suicide, and you want drugs, and you want cries, and you want I have to cut my arm, and cut my hand, and cut the vein. I'm burning in pain. Someone please help me. And where help has to be, it's Allahu Akbar. Help only comes from Allah. This is why we're speaking of this Allahu Akbar. So then back to his ajeeb, amazing qissa. He says the man's every contact was failing. So he came to the masjid. In the masjid there was an elderly person. He was affiliated to the work of da'wah and tabligh. 
So he was a police officer. He came and said, Sheikh, you know, I need some help. I asked a lot of people, but... But you also, because you are a man of the masjid, you got some contact. Many of the musallis of this masjid are also people. Can't you sort out for me? So the sheikh said to him, I do have a top contact. And I don't think it'll be a problem, he'll get your work done. But you will have to speak to him, not me. He said, will he listen to me? He said, this contact of mine will listen to you. So he was so happy like, he said, when can I meet him? He said, he takes about two hours to get an appointment. Sa'atain. Two hours. So for him it was like, no issue because I'm waiting. So only two hours like. I'll meet him in two hours. He said, Sa'atain. Two hours. So he said, who is he like? Is he in charge of this station here? He said, no, higher than that. Higher than that. But now the way he is explaining this, The word higher or bigger in the Arabic language is Akbar. Akbar means bigger. Higher than that. A'la. Akbar. Akbar means higher than this. So he said higher than that. So he said is he one of those provincial ones? He is that Musalli. Higher than that. A'la. So he's looking. He said you know the prince. You know the prince. Who's higher than that provincial guy? He said, Allah. He said, are you thinking of the king? Like, I have to go meet the king. And he'll sort it out. He said, Allah min al-malik. Even higher than the king. Now he's looking and he said, but who is higher than the king? And the sheikh sighed and he said, Allahu Akbar. But he said, the way he said it, Number one, the question itself, when he asked who is higher than the king, shows that me and you also don't believe anyone is higher than the king. Yet, every day, from the time we are born, the first message that is put in my ear and your ear was what? Allahu Akbar. He is the highest. Yet so many years could go and a man can ask this question, who is greater than the king? But me and you also ask it, isn't it? So the first we heard was Allahu Akbar. Every janaza we went to, we heard Allahu Akbar. Every salah we came, we heard Allahu Akbar. The call to the salah, we heard Allahu Akbar. The iqama, we heard Allahu Akbar. Every time going up something, we heard Allahu Akbar. The days of Hajj took place, we only heard Allahu Akbar. Qurbani taking place at Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Every posture in Salah changed, Allahu Akbar. We said it so many thousands of times. But maybe not once did we ever think of the meaning that more higher than all is you, O Allah. So why am I dying for the ones under? When you are the highest, why am I dying for the ones under? So he asked, who is greater than the king? Man ala min al malik, who is greater than the king? And he sighed and he said, Allah, what a question you ask. And this man just looked down. He just looked down. So then the sheikh said to him, Sa'atain, you give me two hours. Meaning I want you to ask Allah for two hours. Sa'atain. And normally in the Arabic language, Sa'atain doesn't even mean two hours. It means like two. Like two moments. Because one Sa'a by Almighty Allah, the word Sa'a doesn't mean like what we call 60 minutes. Makes one hour. Sa'a means a moment. So two moments. Sa'atain. And then he said, Rak'atain, in two rakats. Sa'atain, meaning a small amount of time. Rak'atain, two rakats. And then he said, Dam'atain, and two tears. You give me your sa'atain, your little two minutes, 
Rakatain in which you will take two rakats for Allah. And at the ending or in the sajda, you will take out two chairs, dam'atain. And that contact, inshallah, will sort out your work. You add to everyone else. And every door closed. That door is never going to close. Sa'atain, rak'atain, dam'atain. Two chairs. So this individual, what he had to lose, and the way the shaykh explained it to him, he was feeling so shy himself, he lifted up his hands. He read his two rakats. And he read it with that devotion, which when a man got a need, then you don't just do it fast. Now when that Allahu Akbar is said, and he said that Allahu Akbar, perhaps that was the first time in his life, he ever said Allahu Akbar, how Allahu Akbar was supposed to be said. Because when he was asked, he asked the question, who is greater than the king? Which was a question of kufr. But the answer sent iman right through his body. He said Allah. Now when he said Allahu Akbar, it was a different Allah. Allah give us that Allah. In this ten days, if you can learn it, when that animal is being slaughtered, that blood that is flowing around the world, animals are being slaughtered. Everyone will say, Bismillahi, Allahu Akbar. That Allahu Akbar must send it in us. That after today I will die for none but you, O oh Allah. This animal is an animal. But your name was taken on a normal animal. The meat became halal. Normal animal. It's meat and it's blood left side to side. One name of yours was taken and that animal became halal to eat. Then came these ten days. That very animal was brought on these ten days. It became udhiyah. It now was not just an animal. Now it was going to be heavy on the scales. Now forget the meat, Allah's Nabi said, even the wool will have value. Even the wool. Sahaba said, but wool, wool got so much of hair. Is each strand of wool. Me and you don't even see that wool. Nowadays when the farmers are selling it, they cut the wool first. They shear the animal. Then they sell it. So that the man selling the animal says, I can now see the animal, how much of meat there is. But remember the narration, the more wool on the animal, the more sawab also. Tell that farmer, I know you want to cut it before time. But you know what, this is not for my meat only. I'm going to get rewarded for that skin also. So please just leave that little bit extra wool. The more woolly he looks, I will not get five rand for that wool. Because my skinners will always spoil it. But by my Allah, that wool, every hair in that wool will be pulling a reward. The meat will pull a reward. Allah's Nabi Wasallam said, before that first drop of blood hits the ground, it has already reserved its place in the court of Almighty Allah. What happened? An animal was ready to die for Allah. And every part of that animal which was yesterday napak and dirty, blood, even that blood was accepted in the court of Allah. Me and you, if you say, Allah, I want to die for you, the martyr dies for Allah. His blood becomes valuable. Allah's Rasul wasallam said, the martyr, we don't give him ghusl. The martyr, we don't give him ghusl. If I die, there's no dirt on me. Just death makes me dirty. Just death. They cannot bury me until they wash me. The martyr blood comes out of his body. Blood comes out of my body, my wudu breaks. Blood comes out of his body, he becomes pure. He can't be given ghusl. He is told, put him in the grave with that blood. That martyr on the day of Qiyamah will come with his blood. Allah's Nabi said, like musk it will be. 
What is napak, dirty, a cause of wuzu breaking? He sacrificed for Allah, the dirt became pure. The dirt became musk. Whoever sacrifices for Allah, Allah's Nabi Wasallam said, you hold a horse for Allah. Man ihtabasa farasan fi sabilillah. A man bought a horse. They asked him, why you purchased it? He said, jihad fi sabilillah. This horse is for the path of Allah. Take inspiration. Our getting a horse now is a little far. But we have hope on Almighty Allah. You buying a car. Then when buying the car, I have the intention, I am buying this car so it can take me to the masjid. After that, because the price of petrol, I don't think the governments are going to make it cheaper. So at least when you're seeing that vans flying there, that petrol station, where everybody else will be going into high level depression, the man who said the car is to take me to the house of Allah, at least he can have a hope of reward in every single drop of petrol. The more I pay, the more I score. Otherwise that petrol just goes like anything. Allah's Nabi Wasallam said, You held a horse for Allah. فَإِنَّ شِبْعَهُ وَرِيَّهُ When it becomes saturated, meaning whatever it eats, it just eats and eats and eats. Every time you leave it, you see it eating again. Every time it's drinking, you have to spend on its food, you have to spend on its water. But even a horse is not as expensive as our car today. Everything it eats, everything it drinks, Allah's Nabi said, forget that. He said, everything it lets go, its urine and stool, He said, even its urine and stool will be on your pan when the deeds of man will be weighed. Even its urine and stool has created a certain level of honor in the court of Allah. That if I walk on it, I'll say, Eish, that animal messed up here. But because that animal was held for Allah, even its urine and stool became valuable. You put that car, the sky is to take me to the masjid. We have hope in Allah. Every liter of petrol, every drop of petrol, Every dirt that comes out from the exhaust, every oil that is now and then leaking, every water I have to put in, every tire that has to be changed nearly every few months because of potholes, the sky is costing me a lot. But if I said, Allah, I only purchased it so it will take me to your masjid, every expense in the sky you will find it by Allah. Why? Because that car was told you for Allah. Now what about me and you? If the horse can get so much value, and the car can get so much value, then what about me and you? Why can't I say, Allah, I also want to die for no one but you? Thereafter, my every breath becomes Allah's. Everything got value. My sleep gets value. My work gets value. My talk gets value. It only had one thing. I'll die for Allah, not for the devil. This is that Allahu Akbar. So he said, only ask you for sa'atain. Two moments of your busy schedule. Rakatain, read two rakats. Dam'atain, two chairs. And the contact who is the highest of all contacts will do your job. He did what he had to do. He lifted up his hands. He cried. And thereafter they called him. They told him that the time has come where you will have to move. And he was like, his heart wanted to collapse. You have to move. And he never wanted to move. (coughs) And said he went there to the office. That okay, where must I move to? And when he opened up that letter that you have been selected 
to move to Medina Munawar. And for him it was like a jump of joy. That to Medina Munawar, I'm 100% ready. My whole family wants to move to Medina. And they moved him to Medina Munawar. And then I asked the person, then what happened to him? He became the, what is called, the head of what at that time was called the Aman Force of Medina Munawara, he held that position, I don't know what he told me, maybe 20 years he held it. He never had to come away from Medina Munawara. Normally they move and then you have to come back. He got Medina Munawara and he passed away in Medina Munawara. He said because of that meeting with that sheikh, when he told him, Sa'atain, Rak'atain, Dam'atain, he also became very closely affiliated to the work of Tabligh. He also would go out he learned Allah when he was uh, when he asked the question, "Who is greater than the king?" It was an answer he knew, but perhaps he never thought about it. It's an answer me and you also know. But when the devil calls, then some reason me and you are running to him. When this answer will settle, who is the greatest? And it's Allah. Your whole life will turn. The Mujahid makes a unique victory, conquest. He went fighting with his sword. He broke through that fort. So many died, but he jumped over, jumped over. How many he hit, how many he brought to the ground. Finally, when they conquer, what is a conqueror? A conqueror, forget conquering anything. In the world we got, we only know soccer players and cricket players. Maybe you'll see basketball players. So that cricket player, he just runs. And then he turns his arm. Then that ball sometimes goes out of the field, six. And sometimes it hits the wicket. That's it. He hits the wicket. How he behaves after that? His hands go up. That hands means, I am the greatest. And he starts running wild. Those soccer players, I don't know if they're still doing it, but when they would score a goal, then they would make certain indications with their hands, with their fingers. They would be saying to someone, recently we heard by the kindness of Allah, at least now a lot of deen is coming even in cricket. By the kindness of Allah, so at least these players nowadays, if they win also, you will see immediately they look up to Allah. Or they will go in sajda. And if they talk also, what we have heard is the first thing they will say is, I thank Allah. Then Allah has brought change amongst them. That change must come in me and you also. We can't behave, I bowl someone out, I run like wild. I am the greatest, I'm not the greatest, you just got lucky. Oh, that man can't bet. That's all. It's no big thing. You score the goal. Someone said, wow, and gave you a name. Suddenly at night you're dreaming that I'm the best kicker in the world. When the word Allahu Akbar penetrated the heart, someone who really did something, which was called a mujahid, a soldier who gave his life with his horsemen, they went into the fort. They entered, they conquered, they really did something. Every conqueror that night goes wild. He jumps, he screams, he celebrates. But when Allahu Akbar entered the heart, Muslim conquerors, whenever they entered the city, the first thing that happened was, they imitated the entering of Rasulullah wasallam when he conquered Makkah Mukarramah. His head was on the donkey in sajda. When they entered, the first thing is they fell to the ground in sajda. Afghanistan, they took over what was known as the superpower of the world when running. How they ran. How they ran. When they took over was the celebrations. They can't have liquor like how you will say the others had liquor, they were popping liquor. So you'll say, okay, maybe you pop in Coca-Cola and making it fly. It was nothing like that. It was just everyone in Sajda. Thousands and thousands in Sajda. 
When Allahu Akbar enters the heart, man's own greatness falls to the ground. Then that screams that are taking place in the house. You know who I am. You know what I'll do to you. That one Allahu Akbar will say the answer. That do you know who you are? In front of Allah, you are nothing. The Sahabi was hitting his slave. Behind him, Rasulullah sallallahu one sentence. He says, remember, Allah got more power over you than you have over the slave. He says, I turned around. It was the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was such a word. He said, Allah's Nabi, I free him for the sake of Allah. Finished. When you will allow that Allahu Akbar you heard when you were born, and you heard it when the Mu'addin called, and you heard it when the Iqama was made, and you heard it when you performed Salah, and you hear it during the days of slaughtering, when you'll allow yourself to hear it, but how to come to that? Our nature is, if we don't ever practice, you can't become perfect. So we need to practice with Allahu Akbar. Practice. That is why during these days, I must take a tasbih. And I must say Allahu Akbar, not in the salah, and not the mu'adhin. I must say Allahu Akbar and think, what does it mean? And it must mean to me the same thing what it meant to that man who finally passed away in Medina Mono. One Allahu Akbar entered his heart and his road to Medina Munawara opened. Allahu Akbar enters my heart, my road to Allah will open. Enters your heart, your road to Allah will open. Let this Allahu Akbar during these days come into us. If you want to go out and you say, I am on a holiday, I need to go somewhere, then go places where you see things, you don't see people. Go places where you see things, you don't see people. So if you want to go to the mountains, go to the mountains where you're looking at the mountains, not the mountain climbers. If you want to go to the beach, look at the waves of the ocean, not those surfing the waves. You will have to go searching for the greatness of Allah. You are not going to look for the agents of the devil. Because Allah created certain things which take you to Allah and Allah created certain things that take you very far from Allah. There was a very great scholar of his time, Allama Ibn al Jawzi, he says, I was on my journey for Hajj. We were worried at that time that some people, at that time Bedouins would attack. He said, we were scared they will attack us. So we took a route through the mountains. He said, as I looked at the mountains, I was amazed. I had never thought how great the mountains are. He says, I understood the greatness of Allah more than any other place. Now it's called practicing. He said, then I told myself, if you're amazed at the mountains, then what about the ocean? And how huge the oceans are? How come you never saw the greatness of Allah? He said, then I said to myself, forget the oceans, what about the skies? And I started looking at the skies, never ending skies, never ending skies. And then I said to myself, forget the skies, what's beyond the skies, the heavens? He says, I thought of the narration of Allah that all of this and the seven heavens, everything in front of the chair of Almighty Allah, kursi. Wasiya kursi yuhus samawati wal ard, kursi, chair. In front of the chair of Allah, all of this mentioned in the hadith is like a ring in a huge desert. One ring. (coughs) He said, then the kursi in front of the throne of Almighty Allah. That is like a ring in a huge desert. Now how small are me and you? Now you'll understand what is Allahu Akbar. You go out. And you make the zikr of Allahu Akbar looking at the sky. You go in the mountains and you make Allahu Akbar. But at the end of this holiday, which could be your 10 days of Zul Hijjah, it must take you to the Arsh of Allah. You must say Allahu Akbar so many times. 
that later on when it is asked who you die for, then you say, as the animal is happy to die for Allah, I am also happy to die for Allah. May Allah tabarakallah allow us all to die for Him. Allah make our blood for Him. Inna salati, Ibrahim alayhi salam's words, Allah make it reality for me and you. He said, Allah my worship, inna salati, wa nusuki, my sacrifice, wa mahyaya, my loving, wa mamati, and my dying. Everything is for you, O oh Allah. <coughs> Only for you. La sharika la, not for anyone else. May Allah tabarakallah bless us all with this. Let us love for Allah. Let us die for Allah. Wa akhirah.